Welcome to Journeys Through Sociology, a series of interviews with the Executive Committee of the International Sociological Association. I'm Lale Bey Bohanyan, and our guest today is Dr. Robert Van Creeken, who is joining us from Sydney, Australia. Dr. Van Creeken is a professor of sociology at the University of Sydney, but he has spent the last two years in Ireland as the director of the Social Science Research Center at University College Dublin. He earned his PhD in sociology from the University of New South Wales. He then also went on to earn a law degree and to later establish a program in socio-legal studies at the University of Sydney. Dr. Van Creeken has done extensive research on the history of child welfare in Australia, including focusing on Aboriginal children and questions of cultural genocide. He's also worked on changes in, recent changes in family law in Australia, the US, and Europe. And most recently, he's been working on a book on celebrity society. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Van Creeken. It's a pleasure, Lena. It's nice to be here. It's great. So, Dr. Van Creeken, you know, there's um, a number of, of things I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, but before we really kind of get into the, your history as a sociologist, sure. um, I, I'd love to just start with getting a bit of a sense of the, some of the work that you're currently doing. So could you just perhaps share a bit about what you're particularly excited about in terms of your work right now? Um, well, there are three different things. Some of them are about um, the sociology that I'm doing and some of it's about just being a sociologist. Um, I mean, one thing is about uh, that's kind of exciting, but in a in a challenging way, is what um, how to position sociology in all the changes that are going on in universities these days. Um, there's a lot of talk about a crisis in, in university life, and universities are under a lot of pressure. And um, it's an interesting kind of challenge to be able to figure out how to position sociology in that and. Uh, um, how to work out ways of doing sociology, teaching it, researching it, and so on, um, that can actually um, survive those kind of changes um, and um, and actually contribute to a better understanding of what they're all about. So to be able to do a, sociolo a sociology of what the crisis in universities is all about is an important kind of task. And I'm quite kind of interested in, in doing that. Um, to be able to kind of figure out exactly you know, how we should be responding to all the transformations that are, that are taking place in universities. So I'm mm -hmm. excited about that in a challenging kind of way. We've just had news at, in, at the University of Sydney that we're going to have to um, shed 150 staff, um, which has made people wow. a, bit, a bit concerned. So that's the kind of thing that one needs to, to be able to think yes. about. And develop a, soci a sociological analysis of. Um, I find working in the ISA very exciting. Um, the kind of networks that that, that builds up globally, and so, so sociologists talk about globalization a lot. But the ISA is about actually practicing it and practicing the globalization mm -hmm. of sociology itself. Um, and and the way the ISA is kind of. Um, a good kind of forum for that and a way of, of actually doing globalization in sociology is really mm. exciting um, as well. Um, so I've, I've really enjoyed all the time that I've been working in the ISA and this this project that you're engaged in now of, of interviewing all the executive is a good example of that, of being able to communicate better um, in much better ways um, around the world and to um, give people a clearer understanding of the different kinds of sociology that are being done all around the world. So that's really exciting. Um, in my own writing, um, well, yeah. yeah as you I was said, hoping I just, you would say something about your book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I've just finished a book on, on um, celebrity society, which is a very different topic from what I usually talk about. I usually talk about much more serious, heavy topics like cultural genocide or mm -hmm. state formation and so on. So it's, it's a bit of a change for me. But in a sense, what I'm trying to do is to recover that topic for what you could call serious mainstream sociology. Mm -hmm. It's been neglected a lot, I think, in, in, in um, 
yeah, in mainstream sociology, if you look at the core sociology journals, they don't really talk about it all that much. Um, it tends to be a, a cultural studies kind of um, topic. But I think there's a lot to be said um, in terms of power and inequality um, um, and the, the kind of economics of, of contemporary societies that, um, that's really important and we have to think about celebrity in those terms. The way I usually explain it is to say um, there's a chapter in C. Wright Mills's book, The Power Elite, where he, that's about the celebrities, chapter four. Um, and I think most people, when they read that book, they skip that chapter. I, I mean, I know I did, because right? um, we think we ought to be talking about more serious kind of things. But it's actually really important. And, you know, he, he had a very clear understanding of it back in 1957. And it's still a terrific analysis of the role that paying attention to high profile individuals plays in the way in which power is structured, um, the way status works, um, and so on. So that, that's what I've been working on. Dr. Van Creek, and I know I actually had a, the, the privilege of getting to, to take a look at the, your book that's forthcoming on Celebrity Society. And I noticed that you introduce one of the chapters, your introductory chapter, with um, this quote, which, forgive me if I don't paraphrase it correctly, but something along the lines of, you know, you could tell a lot about a society by who it celebrates. Um, yeah. And so if you could just say a little bit about, in terms of your work on, on celebrity society, how do you approach celebrity as a sociologist? And, and what can taking celebrity seriously um, as sociologists, what can that tell us about our societies? Um, well, um, that, that's a line from a Woody Allen film. Um, <laughs> and I partly put it in there because he's a celebrity. <laughs> um, but I call it court, um, celebrity society because I'm drawing on Norbert Elias's work. Um, people know him mostly for him talking about the civilizing process, but part of the analysis is to look at court society, right? So the way in which people related to each other, the structure of social relationships in aristocratic, princely, royal courts, right? So the way in which pe um, people would organize themselves around a prince or a king or, or a queen mm -hmm. and the kind of behavior that that, that, that encouraged. Mm -hmm. And basically what I'm trying to argue is that um, that that kind of social form has been modernized and court society is like the contemporary, ver uh, celebrity society is the contemporary version of court society. Mm -hmm. It's court society in the age of the mass media and so on. Mm -hmm. So essentially, Oprah Winfrey is is running a salon, but um, in the same way that you know an aristocratic French woman would have run one in in the seventeenth century, but her audience is just different and it's mm -hmm. a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. um, so she can project her salon onto the whole world stage, but the logic of its operation is actually more or less the same um, as a as a seventeenth century salon, and it's. I mean, celebrities are today's aristocracy, um, and we relate to them. Well, we relate to them in a in a different way from aristocracy in the past. But the the logic of the relationship is still is still very similar. So it, um, the yeah. the logic of the relationship is similar. But Dr. Van Kriegen, do you do you observe any change? Let's say in the past t 20, 30 years, um, in terms of the nature the the. Of, of celebrity because many people do increasingly kind of complain about quote the cult of celebrity and and there are these these observations that would become increasingly more so kind of absorbed in a celebrity culture do you see kind of a historical change happening look there's there's always a problem when you look at, at any kind of history of both continuity and change um, so there if you look back at the I mean that's partly what I want to write about about the ways in which when you look at the way people related to actors and actresses in, in the 19th century, for example. Mm. Um, there were incredible crazes about particular um, individual actors that, that look a lot like, I don't know, Beatlemania today or something. So that, mm. that, that, uh, that capacity to, to generate kind of mass hysteria around an individual actually has quite a long history. Mm. So the idea itself um, that people can be obsessed with someone um, isn't all that new, but obviously what really changes is the technology and 
um, the kind of practical ways in which that can that can be realised. Yes, right. um, so there's a kind of intensification of it. That that's one of the main changes. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. the problem is to not think that it, it was just invented, you know, with Hollywood and in, in, in the 20th century to look back further in history um, and, and then to work out exactly what the changes are. Um, and it's about spreading the possibilities for celebrity. Um, Warhol's, we all know Warhol said that um, in the future everyone will be famous for 15 minutes, but a bit later he said, um, oh, I'm bored with that line. Now I say, in 15 minutes, everyone will be famous. And there's, there's a lot of that going on at the moment. So that's a major change. Oh. So, and, you know, when I, I would like Dr. Van Cricken to be able to talk a bit about, about kind of your history in sociology. Um, sure. Because your work is, has always involved a level of, of interdisciplinarity, you know, bringing sociology together with law, with history. Um, but, you know, even, even though you, you continue to do quite interdisciplinary work, I'd be interested in knowing what is it that drew you to sociology in the first place, and, and maybe if you could talk to us about a few of the reasons that, that you were drawn to sociology. Um, in a strange way, it's almost because it makes the interdisciplinarity more possible. I mean, I, I suppose it's a bit excessive to, to characterize sociology as the queen of the social sciences, but it does seem to actually be positioned in relation to the other social sciences in a very strategic kind of way, that it, it just seems more possible to, to draw on a greater variety of different disciplines when you're doing sociology. I mean, in my own um, biography, I actually started off thinking I wanted to do psychology, and so that was, that was what I, I thought I was going to do. Although I'd read a bit of anthropology before that as well, so I wanted some strange kind of mixture of the two. And it just turned out that sociology was in fact the place where I could do the kind of psychology that I wanted to do. So I got excited by the Frankfurt School people and you know all that kind of work that tried to link Marxism with psychoanalysis, um, that kind of orientation. And um, so I actually find I could do more of the psychology I wanted to do in sociology. And then the same with history, um, I could actually um, um, develop quite interesting sociological ideas precisely by drawing on historical analyses. I would always do the history in a different way from the historians. So it is historical sociology rather than history. Um, but it's, it's in a strange way, it's precisely what's um, powerful about sociology as a discipline that it that it's it can open. usefully draw on all these disciplines. Mm. Sometimes that can, of course, also be a weakness, right, in the sense that um, it means it's easy for sociological ideas and arguments to migrate to, to disciplines outside of sociology without people recognising that that's where it's come from. Right? So a lot of sociological ideas have just become common currency and everyone goes, oh, yes, we all know that that's, you know, how you think about things without actually identifying it as a, as a sociological argument. Um, so that's, that's a kind of a weakness that emerges from its own strength. Right, right. Um, so the interdisciplinarity of sociology, or the, the openness of sociology to, to the influence of other disciplines is one of the things that drew you to. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, Weber was trained as a, um, as a lawyer to start with. Um, um, a lot of sociologists come to the discipline from other other disciplines, right? So they come to it from politics or, or from law, um, sometimes from social psychology and so yeah. on. Um, Which so I, I you're absolutely right. In, in most of our interviews, we've had a number of the ISA executive committee members say they came upon sociology accidentally and they, they were attempting to do mathematics or whatever it was and, and, and then found themselves kind of slipping into sociology. Yeah. 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 Um, so I, I think that's actually one of its characteristics. Mm -hmm. So, and are there any other are there any other aspects of sociology that you would say were important? Well, to... well just personally, what I've liked about it is um, because it's got that kind of potential for um, for interdisciplinary linkages. It's given me lots of things to do. Basically, lots of um, opportunities to to build things. I, my father was an engineer, a kind of marine engineer, and I 
always used to think that what I was interested in was completely different from him, right? So, so the son wasn't really following in the father's footsteps. Um, but I realized one day that, in fact, I was my father's son in, in the sense that I like to build things. I like, in that sense, I'm a different kind of engineer. I like to, to build, um, I don't know, social legal programs or, or research committees in the ISA or something. And yeah. sociology just provided a lot of opportunity for doing that. Um, um, there's lots of new things that one can, one can always do. Um, and that's, that's another attraction that I found for it. it. It enabled me to be um, to be an engineer of um, of sociological creations, I suppose. Right, and and to work on so many different things, as you said, from celebrity society to issues of cultural genocide and family law. Um, right. Yeah. So could we maybe actually shift a little bit now to talking about some challenges um, as well, Dr. Van Creeken? So, you know, in your own kind of trajectory as a sociologist, what would you say are maybe three of the most significant challenges that you faced? Um, well, one, one challenge is, is one that's true of all academic work, which is just to come up with the right kind of balance between um, the, the ever-increasing demands that that work places um, on us and life at home and life mm -hmm. life with your family um, and so on. So to get that kind of work-life balance right is um, is, a, is a real challenge. It's something you have to think about a lot. Because mm -hmm. um, the trouble with universities these days is that there's no real ceiling on what on what is expected of you. So because the com the competitive dynamics are such that that it can always be better. Right? So it's yeah. very hard. Unlike, say, a, a carpenter who can say, okay, I've built this, that's great, you know, I've finished with that. Um, with academic work, it's always, oh, you can do a bit more, you know, you could write another book. Or, right. so, so it's hard to ever sort of be, be satisfied with, with what you've done. And that, make, that tends to crowd out the other parts of your life. So it's hard to be a proper human being. So I'm actually, Dr. Van Kruken, I'm I'm really glad that you brought this up because most of the, the ISA members that we've talked to thus far have really kind of um, responded to, to this question of challenges uh, from the perspective of, of sociologists, the challenges they face as sociologists. Um, and you really bring up this issue of the challenge we face as human beings trying to work as sociologists and, and balancing all of these demands. And I have to say, I'm glad you brought it up because as a graduate student myself, um, you know, I watch the professors that I work with and, and I'm always amazed and, and in awe of how it is that they are able to balance the, the research and the teaching and the administrative demands and family and, um, and I have to say I still haven't really found out what the, the key to, to doing that is. Um, but so I guess at least I feel reassured to hear that you, that you struggle with it and it's not that there's some secret that I'm missing out on. Well, it, it really helps um, if you don't need very much sleep. <laughs> so, basically, I think the world belongs to people that sleep three hours a, a, a day. Night, so. a day yeah. um, another one, you, you mentioned balancing teaching and research and admin, and that, that's really another challenge, right? because you can see what's going on in universities, what has been going on for quite a long time, it has been um, this gradual um, intensification of expectations of us in both those areas, teaching and research, mm. in ways that actually contradict each other. And so we're being expected to both teach more and more students, pay more and more attention to the quality of, of our teaching, and to be more and more productive um, in our research. Mm. Um, and at some point those two things just, just don't kind of mesh very well together at all. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, the effects of that has been for some places to create research only positions. Um, so you can see this, this kind of construction of a almost kind of three class system within universities, so a kind of elite of research only um, staff and then a kind of middle class of people that have to do teaching and research and then a, a proletariat of kind of mm -hmm. casual um, part time um, workers and um, one of the real challenges is to figure out how to kind of navigate your way through that. Mm -hmm. 
possibly develop some arguments against that kind of restructuring of academic life. Um, um, but yeah, that, that's that's a major challenge, I think, to try and figure out how to how to relate teaching to research. Um, I'm not sure what it's like in, in other in, in the US, or, or I don't get a clear picture um, from other parts of the world either. But in in Australia, there's been this tendency to to focus primarily on research mm. and to not take teaching as seriously mm. as as it ought to. And mm. that that's a problem, and that's a that's a challenge to be able to think about that properly because in the end it's the students that, 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 that are the future and that's really who we should be orientating ourselves towards. Yes, and I would say it is very similar in the U.S., very similar, yeah. that, that most kudos are given for research and, and not nearly enough credit is really given for the teaching that gets yeah. done. Yeah. Um, another challenge is, I think I've talked about, about it in different ways already, but the whole issue of how to position sociology in relation to other disciplines is an important challenge, right? To get a clear picture of what it is that sociology um, can contribute that's distinctive and, 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 and what, what gives it a unique kind of voice in relation to other disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, to some extent that's to do with, um, with some of the natural science disciplines. Right? So to be able to um, explain things in terms other than genetics or, or, or the brain or something is an important um, issue for sociology. Um, mm -hmm. To come up with a persuasive kind of account of, of why it is people um, um, behave the way they do or, or, or why they relate to each other the way they do. Because mm -hmm. there's a very powerful push to try and explain everything in terms of, of, of genetics or the structure of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, and so on. So I, I think that's an important challenge for us to be able to take up a position in public debates that, that explains clearly what a, a specifically sociological imagination can contribute to those mm -hmm. kinds of issues. And it seems like that's precisely what you're doing with your work on celebrity society is taking, yeah. Yeah. you know, this yeah. topic that's usually not taken seriously in that yeah. sense and, and yeah. bring a sociological perspective. Okay. That's right, because everyone tends to sort of say, I don't understand, like, I don't understand why people read the magazines or why someone's become such a, a celebrity. Um, we had Kim Kardashian visiting Australia um, last week. Yes, we heard about that in the US. <laughs> <laughs> well, she'd only just um, divorced her, her husband after, what was it, 72 hours or something? Um, and that tends to be the response of, I don't understand. And I think it is understandable. It's because attention is itself a, a resource that, that some people are good at collecting and distributing and mm. so on. And so Kim Kardashian is a kind of industry in the production of attention, um, which then gets um, kind of directed towards the products that she promotes or the television programs that she's on um, and so on. So, so yeah, I think I think it, it is possible to understand what what celebrity is all about. And I think that I mean, we tend to not only say that we don't understand, but oftentimes we're also quite judgmental of ourselves for our fascination yeah, yeah. with celebrity. You know, on the one hand, we're we're drawn to it and fascinated, but on the other hand, kind of uncomfortable with 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 being that way. Yeah. That's right. And some people will say that they're surprised that when they ask young children what they would like to be when they grow up, um, how many of them will say, I want to be famous or I want to be on television and mm -hmm. so on. And they sort of seem surprised at that. But, but I think that's because kids actually have a very good intuitive sense of what you need to do to, to get on in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And being kind of, kind of recognised and acknowledged by um, a relatively large number of people is now is now a part of what of what it means to be successful. It's not mm -hmm. good enough anymore to just be good at your job. You have to be good at your job and a celebrity in that in that field. Right. Um, yes. And and that's what I think children actually kind of get a sense of fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. That's why things like programs, those talent shows, and the X Factor and so on, mm -hmm. are so. Um, are watched by so many people because they're getting clues as to how you do it, how you get that X factor. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 
And then and I would say that and the public is also fascinated by the idea of, of just any one of us has the potential to, to then right. get that X factor, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. It's that old narrative of, you know, from, from rags to riches, you know, that, that anyone can make it. And so it's about social mobility and, um, and status and so on, yeah. Right. So, yeah, that, that's what I'm, I found exciting about that project. So, Dr. Van Quicken, unfortunately, we're, we're starting to run out of time, but there is one last question I'd like to pose for you, um, which I've asked of, of all the other ISA members. If you had not become a sociologist, what else do you think you might have liked to have pursued? Um, that's a hard question. Um, the, um, there haven't really been that many clear points where I had a choice going in one direction rather than another. But there's two possibilities. One is um, I've sometimes thought about becoming a psychotherapist. Um, I don't know if you watch the program In Treatment. Um, I've never seen uh, it though. Have a look. Have a look. Um, <laughs> it's about a psychoanalyst, um, and I've sometimes had this kind of ambition that possibly I could do that that kind of work. Mm. Um, so yeah, being a psychotherapist is one possibility. What may I ask? What is it that draws you to that? What is it that, that is interesting? I've always us? been interested in um, in psychoanalysis and the way it understands people. Um, in a sense, sociology is 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 about similar kinds of things. It's about trying to trying to understand the way um, people behave, why they behave, they do. Um, the way they do, and and psychotherapy is just a practical kind of intervention into that, or perhaps intervention is too strong a word. Contribution to to the way that works. Um, so yeah, that that's that's one thing I could have been. Um, you mentioned before that I did a, a law degree, so um, and yeah, that was another possibility that that I, I wouldn't mind um, practicing as a lawyer. So I think. The, the answer to the question is that I would either be a psychotherapist or a lawyer or perhaps some combination of the two. Right. Well, Dr. Van Kriegen, thank you so, so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure having you with us. It's been a fascinating discussion. It was a great pleasure to talk to you later. This has been another Journey Through Sociology with Dr. Robert Van Kriegen. Please join us again next time when our guest will be Professor Jennifer Platt from England.